Today, Brother Robert Taylor is going to be moderating our forum. Brother Taylor has been here on many occasions in this capacity, serving to try to uh, glean from the Word of God information that would help us in answering questions that we might have concerning uh, the will of God. We're going to be asking you again, as has been always the situation, that uh, questions be asked at the proper time when Brother Taylor so indicates. And let me ask this of you. If you need to make a response, make a comment, or ask a question, please hold up your hand and let one of the men get to you with the microphone. There's two reasons for that. One is that so everybody in the auditorium can hear, but another reason is that uh, so that it can be recorded on our audio tapes. And uh, they will be with you in just, uh, just a moment, if you'll just let it be known that you'd like to speak. I ask you again to, as you have so graciously conducted this forum, that everything that's done be done decently and in order and with the fine Christian spirit that's always been exemplified in our question and answer period. And now, without further delay, Brother Taylor. Thank you very much, Brother Eddie, and it's a real joy to be before you again this afternoon. I have deeply appreciated every invitation to chair this part of the program the last couple of years and appreciate the confidence expressed in me and asking that I do it again. Sometimes some unusual things occur in connection with doing work like this. Back in December 1984, there was a preacher's get-together over in West Tennessee where I live and two brethren were going to suggest differences of opinions that morning and two speeches. They called and asked if I would drive up and be the moderator for the open forum to follow both of those speeches. The morning I was to go up, I was talking to my wife at breakfast and telling her what the nature of the program was to be, and she said, now, how are you going to answer this or that or some other if it comes up? I said, honey, you don't have to worry about that because the moderator doesn't have to know anything. And she's always been my quick on the draw McGraw wit in our family, and she quickly responded, well, they surely have the right fellow in you then. <laughs> I think one of the most interesting questions I've ever had, I was in the Chicago area a while back, back last spring, and had a question answer period after the sermon each night, and those of you that have done this know that usually the questions are handed to you and sometimes one doesn't even know what the nature of them is until he's opened the question. But here's this question I had handed to me one night. Is it true that you attended Bethany College and sat at the feet of Alexander Campbell? <laughs> I think I know now why nobody ever introduces me as a young gospel preacher anymore. Then when I look in the mirror each morning, count my 53 hairs on my head, I know the other reason. I fully concur with the statement made by Brother Eddie a moment ago that we all conduct ourselves decently in order. This is what Paul suggests that we do in the First Corinthian epistle. And as was mentioned yesterday by Brother McCord, this is not a legislative session. We're not here to devise doctrine. The Bible teaches in James 4.12, there's one lawgiver, He's already taken care of that department. This is a study session, uh, not exactly like all the others that we have during the day, but still a study session with this difference. You are given a responsibility to respond. I'm going to set forth about three or four different areas of thought that I've been asked to comment upon, and then we'll throw it open for any comments or observations or disagreements from you. I'm taking the questions in the exact order in which they were handed to me. It is a temptation to go through and pick the easier ones and save the harder ones for the next two days, but that I have not done. I made one exception. There was a late question handed to me that's somewhat similar to the opening one, and I'm going to discuss both of these together. Please comment on the latest unity efforts 
on the part of some of our brethren with the independent Christian church or conservative Christian church. Especially comment on the Restoration Summit at Joplin, Missouri and subsequent meetings that have arisen from it. Brother Eddie made a comment in regard to the position that the Brown Trail Congregation sustains to this at one of the sessions yesterday. Those of you that may have been here this morning and heard Brother Noel Meredith, he uh, offered a number of comments about that, and he set forth exactly my attitude and my comments about this. Really, these movements are not new. Back in the 1930s, there were a number of sessions between our brethren and the Christian church under the leadership of Murch and Whitty, Brother Whitty representing our position and Murch representing the position of the Christian church preachers. And about 1939, Brother H. Leo Bowles was invited to come to Annapolis and give a speech, which he did. The Gospel Advocate later gave that speech in installments and more recently, it has been repeated in The Advocate. Also, a track of that speech has been made, not, been made available by the Getwell Congregation in Memphis, Tennessee, giving the entire speech that Brother Bowles gave. I believe that meetings like this, if they would really and truly get down to the nitty-gritty of what divides us from the independent Christian church, might result in some good. But when some of the chief things that divide us, such as the mechanical instrument, are passed over without an in-depth study, I believe that good is not going to be accomplished. I strongly, strongly disagree with some of the things that came out of the Joplin meeting, and I have listened to about seven or eight hours on the videotape, thanks to Brother Joe McDonald, and we're all indebted to, to him for what he did in videoing this. But there are some concepts that come out of this that I believe to be extremely dangerous. I do not believe that the mechanical instrument is simply a hermeneutical issue or the, or the uh, science of interpreting the scripture. No more so than I believe that when the Catholics have brought in their incense, that is just simply a matter of a biblical, hermeneutical approach. No more than I would believe that when elements of the Lord's Supper are changed, we had a brother over in West Tennessee two or three years ago who advocated that it'd be all right to have a hot dog bun on the Lord's table. That is a matter of respect for Bible authority whether we're going to do what the Lord tells us to do or not. He has authorized that we sing. He has not authorized that we play in our worship. Hence, it is a matter of respect of God's word in this matter of the mechanical instrument of music. It appears to me to be very significant that some of the people in the organization of the Christian church recognize that it is a matter of biblical authority. I remember some years ago having a discussion with a young lady who was a member of the independent Christian church. And we did not talk long until we got around to discussing the nitty gritty of the instrument. And I've always appreciated the candor with which she answered some of my questions. She said, I know, and so do my brethren, that there is no authority for the usage of the mechanical instrument in worship. Then listen to her next statement. My brethren and I use it because we like it. I think that's the reason that any of them use it. I never have believed they used it because David did. David did a hundred things they don't touch base on. I don't believe they use it because they think it's going to be in heaven or that one ought to employ his talents because there are many other areas that they do not use their talents in a matter of worship. It is a matter of respect for biblical authority. Now what about some of the subsequent meetings? Well, I understand from one of the ones from our group who went that there are two major meetings supposedly to occur 
sometime in 1985. But also there are a number of what they call many meetings. Brother Noah Meredith referred to this this morning as they have gone into various parts of the country and held different sessions. Now again, if they would get down to the nitty-gritty of some of the things that really and truly divide us, then perhaps good might occur. And I certainly don't subscribe to the attitude that we have been vicious and harsh toward these people. I've often discussed the issue of the mechanical instrument with these people and with others. And I try to be just as kind and gentle in discussing these matters with them as I would have them to be if the positions were reversed. Now, some of these 50 of our men who went out there, if they have been harsh in these matters and uncross like then for that they need to repent. But certainly never repent for a willingness to stand up in behalf of the truth. I think it's rather significant, and this may have just a little bit of a bearing on some of the differences between us. We do not have a Christian church in Ripley, Tennessee. There is one uh, in the northern part of the county, but several miles from where I live. We recently had a family move to our town. They moved from the Illinois area, and they are members of the Christian church. So far, they have attended our service one time. And uh, one of the members in the family wanted to know immediately, do you people have anything in writing about what you stand for here? His next question was, I feel like the younger members of my family will be interested in knowing what you are planning to do for the young people. And he also brought me some literature from the congregation where he had been an assistant minister, and it is just filled with some of the practices of denominationalism. This was about Christmas time when they moved, and the bulletin that he brought and showed me showed that they were going all out in their so-called Christmas observances for that season of the year. Now another question along this same line that I'll go ahead and get before you. This question, Brother Taylor, would you agree that the failure to recognize and accept the authority of the Bible on the part of the members of the Christian church, which has begun to infiltrate the churches of Christ, is actually the result of a failure on the part of these people to turn from the sinful gratification of their own selfish desires to serve God, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9. Well, I again refer to the attitude of the young lady who suggested my brethren and I use it because we like it. I believe involved is this matter of the gratification of that which will be pleasing to us. And I might add that one doesn't have to bring in a dozen innovations in order for worship to be corrupted. David and the people who moved the ark in the Old Testament didn't have to violate every precept about its being moved in order to be in violation. But when they made a new ox card, instead of conveying it upon the shoulders of the priesthood or the Levitical uh, tribe, they violated the law of God Almighty. Noah and the building of the ark of the Old Testament would not have had to violate every precept that the Lord gave him in Genesis 6 in order to have stood in violation of God's will. And the same is true with any matter of Christian worship or anything else that is involved in our relationship to God. I have preached for years along the line that if a parent tells a child to do five things and the child does four, the child has not been obedient to the father's authority. He has rebelled against that authority by ignoring to do what the father told him to do. That's certainly true as far as Christianity is concerned. And then one or two other matters. In Deuteronomy 1 and verse 37, Moses makes a statement that lays guilt upon the people of Israel that rightly belong to him. Why did this lie go uncorrected? Well, in the first place, I don't believe that it's a lie to which Moses refers in Deuteronomy 1 and verse 37. Let me say just a bit about the book of Deuteronomy. It 
in all probability, is the last of the five books that Moses wrote, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the Pentateuch. This book is composed of speeches that Moses gave in a rehearsal or a repetition of the law. Of course, a new generation has now come on, about ready to enter the land of Palestine, and the book is filled with a rehearsal of the law and much about the history of these people for the last 40 years. In Deuteronomy 1 and verse 37, Moses makes mention of the fact that the Lord was angry at me for your sakes, saying, Thou shalt not go in thither. Really, the guilt lay upon both Moses and the people that had uh, uh, more or less just frustrated him and protested to such an extent that, as the psalmist suggested in Psalm 106, verses 32 and 33, that the people even provoked God to anger, and they provoked Moses to anger, insomuch that it went ill with Moses, causing him to speak unadvisedly with his lips. If we go back to the origin of this sin, Numbers the 20th chapter and the opening verses, we find that the people had come to the waters of Meribah. Again, they began to complain because there was no water available for them before God miraculously provided it. As they had done again and again, they complained against God, especially chided Moses, you brought us into this land where there, are no, there is no food, where there is no water, then better for us to have been left in the land of Egypt. And so Moses, becoming evidently uh, frustrated, impatient, along with Aaron, instead of speaking to the rock as God commanded him, he struck the rock. And so the people uh, bear the blame for uh, prodding him, chiding him, and Moses bore the blame for not resisting this and going ahead and uh, uh, not doing what the Lord actually commanded him to do. So really, the skirts of the people are not clean in this matter at all. They not only drove the Lord to anger, but also Moses to anger as well. One other question, and then we'll turn it over to you for any comments. Following the theme of good works or pure living, please discuss the pure religion of James 1.27 as it applies to spiritual morality. The passage says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself or oneself unspotted from the world. The previous verse, I think, is of interest, because if a man think himself or seemeth to be religious, and bridleth not his own tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Hence there is a marked contrast drawn between vain religion, one that is empty, one that is minus profit, and then the pure religion that is described in verse 27. The pure religion is one that is pure in the sight of God. It is undefiled, that is, no blemish is attached to it. It is composed of benevolence, and a beauty of a pure life. First of all, that one visit the widows and the orphans and their affliction. The word visit there means visiting from the standpoint of determining the help that ought to be rendered and being diligent in doing that. Of course, this passage has long been a battleground between us and uh, some of those who are opposed to our helping widows and orphans and now has descended into whether it's even right for the church from its treasury to help people who are not Christians. I helped Brother Noel Meredith in a debate in Mississippi, moderated for him on both occasions, in which we discussed this with two preachers who were of the persuasion that the church, as the church, can only help its own, nobody else. But really, this question touches the latter part, that is, of uh, remaining unspotted from the world. Well, to remain unspotted from the world is certainly a part of morality or spiritual morality. For instance, James tells us that uh, friendship with the world is enmity with God, James 4 and 4. And John gives perhaps the finest definition of worldliness anywhere in the scriptures, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. 
Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, and then he assures us that these things do not belong to the Father, they belong to the world. The world is going to perish, and so will the ones who give themselves over to this kind of life. To remain unspotted from the world is to remain in such a condition that the world does not contaminate us, that it does not defile us. And of course, the only way to do that is with a pure heart and a pure set of words and a pure set of daily deeds. Really, all evil, as far as we're concerned, originates within our heart. And if it's not put out, it'll actually develop itself into sinful words or sinful deeds or usually a combination of both. Certainly, pure religion on undefiled is inclusive of a life of morality. And a person would be highly inconsistent to emphasize that we ought to be true and loyal to the first requirement, that is, visiting the widows and the orphans in their affliction, and then to be totally unconcerned about the manner of his or her life. Both of these are required. There's a principle set forth in the Bible that what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. That not only applies to husband and wife in its initial context, but it applies to anything that the Almighty has linked together. And he has joined benevolence and a beautiful life of purity in James 1 and 27. And we can't practice just half of that verse and be acceptable in the sight of God Almighty. Oh, how greatly we all need all the help that we can, can have in this matter of trying to be a pure people, trying to be a morally minded people. Remember, Paul suggests in Romans 8 to be spiritually minded is life and peace, but to be carnally minded is death. Leads to separation from God here, and if not repented of, will ultimately lead to eternal separation. Now, I'm sure... I still have more questions, but I'm sure we've said some things to which some of you would like to respond. And let's be sure and honor Brother Eddie's request that if you wish to make an observation, hold your hand up, please, and a microphone will be brought to you about any of these matters. All right, if somebody will get to Brother Foy. Boy, forehand from Davis, Oklahoma. I don't know very much about the summit meetings. Uh, before we moved from here back in the fall, uh, at the preacher's luncheon, some men who had been there came and some things were said that were, uh, to my way of thinking, rather outlandish. But we need to keep in our minds, and for our own benefit, that while it's often the case that the leadership in not only the Christian denomination but in all denominations have some pretty dishonest attitudes about dealing with God's word. Many of the members of those denominations in their ignorance love God and would want to do his will if they knew it and we need to be finding them. Okay. The other thing I'd like to say about this business of keeping oneself unspotted from the world, it has a lot of ramifications, uh, not just to the taking care of widows and orphans, not just to things that are big and obvious, but also in little things. Uh, I'm glad I got to lead that song a few minutes ago, Yield Not to Temptation. Uh, what I really wanted to say is, let's remember that being tempted is not the sin. Even our Lord was tempted. We have to overcome the temptation and go on and live the pure life after that. And that's vitally important. All right. I think these are marvelous statements. And in regard to what Brother Forrest suggested, first of all, all of us as Christians are interested in unity, but there's only one way in which, is, which, in which it is going to be achieved, and that is upon the basis of God's holy word. When I sit down and talk to somebody who, with whom I have several differences, I don't mind suggesting, now here are some areas in which we are very, very close together. Let's stay together on these points. 
Here are other areas in which we're not together. And let us, in the spirit of goodwill, examine these things. And uh, I am personally not willing to sweep anything under the floor that ought to be discussed in this matter. All right, Ken? Ken Chumley from Mathis, Texas. Back in 1967, I came out of the Christian church in Australia. I was preaching for the Christian church over there. I'd just like to make a few comments with respect to the recent summit meetings and what's been going on. First of all, some of the brethren, some of the things that they've been saying do not represent where I stand and where I come from. And what's being said is to the effect that I might just as well have stayed where I was back in 1967 and everything would be perfectly fine and in order. I don't believe that for one minute. Another thing, too, that we need to keep in mind is that uh, there is a great diversity of belief amongst the independent Christian churches. A lot of us have the idea that the only difference is the mechanical instrument of music. That is very far from the truth in many instances. It depends which individual congregation in many instances and which member you're talking to as to where they stand. Some, it may be only the instrument. But in others, it may be almost anything else that you care to name. And in fact, I was reading just last month in one of their magazines that uh, the Restoration Herald, which incidentally has not given publicity to the summit meeting, but was giving publicity to a meeting amongst the independent Christian churches to see if they could not get together on what they believe. They have a wide diversity amongst themselves. And if there's any idea of merger, where do we go? What do we merge with, discounting the instrument? Just for sake of argument, where do we go? There's so many things. You mentioned about Christmas and some of these other things that they tack up. They have women elders and preachers, and they have changed. I was just reading in that same magazine about changes that have occurred in Australia since 1967, that it's completely different to what I knew back then. And one other point, let's not get the idea that they are getting soft on the instrument. Last year, about the uh, fall of 83, I believe, uh, there was a series of articles in the Restoration Herald by Victor Knowles on instrumental music called Trumpets in the Temple, which I responded to, and it was published in the Restore. They are still standing firm on what they believe in many instances. And for, uh, for brethren to give ground where there's no place to give ground on this issue is a very serious matter. We need to rethink and restudy and go back to the book. My feeling and my belief has been in all of my preaching experience in this country that the reason why we face a lot of the problems we do today is this matter of authority has not been taught. And when it's not been taught, then you open the doors to a little thing, and a lot of other things come in. We are heading in the same direction today as happened at the turn of the century. The actual item is not the instrument this time. There are a lot of other things that are being done. The family life centers and things of this nature. And what we're getting into again is we're ignoring the authority of the scripture. And I would plead with brethren, we need to preach more lessons at our home congregation on the authority of the word of God, the first principles of God's authority. I found so many people that have been members of the Lord's church for years that do not know why we do not use mechanical instruments. And that's sad. It's not only sad, it's dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Ken. I think we all ought to give careful attention to a man who has been among them and came out. Over in the area where I live and preach, we have a man by the name of Dan Goddard who preached for a number of years for the Independent Christian Church, and he has currently begun a series in the Firm Foundation. One article I've already read, I don't know how many plans, but he's talking about some of the differences between the independent Christian church with which he was formally identified, worked for some of their big congregations, and the uh, churches of Christ. Uh, if you take firm foundation, I would urge that you read the articles by Brother Goddard. 
He's another one that's speaking out of experience. All right, Brother McClish. Uh, Robert, uh, some of those that attended the summit came away with uh, much different attitudes from others who attended the summit. Uh, this has been borne out in uh, talking with some of those, and I've had the privilege of doing that in some cases. I know one uh, attendant among our brethren said that he came away with the feeling that there were many more of our brethren present at the summit who would be willing to give ground on the instrument than were there among the independent Christian church men there who would be willing to give the instrument up. It is such concerns as these, not only about what took place at the summit, but who was there with what took place that is a matter of grave concern to me and I think should be to us all. All right, I appreciate that statement. It just coincides with what Brother Ken suggested about the fact don't mistake their getting soft on the instrument. If anybody's getting soft on the instrument, it's some of our brethren. Brother Guy in Woods has said for years that a good many of our brethren don't know why we don't use it, and another goodly portion wouldn't have any objections if it were brought in. By the way, those who have made a study of how it got in back a few decades ago and then began its divisive work, they brought it in according to what I have learned down through the Bible school department in the basement rooms suggesting it's all right to have it in our Bible school rooms. But when that generation grew up, they just took the piano upstairs with them and put it into their worship. Now the idea of inviting them into our Bible classes and what basically is the difference between falsehood taught in a Bible class and taught from the pulpit, except you have a few more people to hear it in the auditorium. But even if there were just one person in the Bible class, still error ought to be kept out. And uh, we ought not to be willing to bring in anybody for a Bible class, a VBS, a pulpit exchange, but what that person is sound in the faith. All right, who else? All right. Brother Taylor, I'm a, my name is Charles Hoover. I'm an elder in the church, and I won't tell where I'm from, so I won't embarrass my brethren. I want to talk about something that's more sacred than uh, motherhood. You mentioned, and so did the brother that came out of the first Christian church, about Christmas. It's not just in the Christian church, it's in the Church of Christ. I would to God that uh, you preachers would influence our brotherhood to put out some Bible school material that would teach on the birth of Christ maybe in July or some other time. It just goes right along with the, the material that's put out by the denominations. That's all I have. All right. Ah, let me respond to that invitation, a number of years, or that response rather. A number of years ago, I've been writing for the Gospel Advocate, the Adult Quarterly, for a number of years, and I remember in particular, one December we had a series that began, and either the third or the fourth Sunday in December, we had a lesson on the birth of Christ. And some of the brethren were really, really critical that we chose to do it at that time, but the material that I wrote was in refutation of uh, the errors that have crept in in regard to the birth of our Lord. I would not hesitate on Easter Sunday to tell an audience what's wrong with keeping the Easter Sunday observance. A lot of people are going to be there that day that will not be there any other time. In fact, the elders where I preach occasionally on the Sunday before December the 25th as they did this past December and the December before that suggests, say something about why we don't keep the Christmas season in churches of Christ. And that I did. And by the way, this family I mentioned were there that Sunday, and that's what upset them because I taught the very opposite of what they had been accustomed to in the Christian church up in northern Illinois. All right? Who? Brother Joe, I guess, next. My name is Joe Gilmore. And uh, recently, or some time ago, the Catholic Church was talking an ecumenical movement. 
So when it narrowed down, uh, there was no major give up. Uh, they weren't really, uh, really thinking of giving up uh, worship the Virgin Mary, uh, holy water, or mass. So what they were ecumenical about was whether they would uh, have mass in Latin or in English. But the Catholic Church wasn't willing to actually didn't have in mind the giving up any major issue. In California, this thing has been going on for some time with the same people. Uh, Don DeWilt, uh, Mr. Jessup, Brother G.K. Wallace and I, we have debated them many times. In California, Glenn Wallace and I debated uh, DeWilt and uh, two or three others. But some time ago, about 10 years ago, they attempted to have a uh, unity meeting in San Jose like they did in Missouri. Uh, this is the headquarters of uh, the Don Jess the Bill Jessup and the Don D. Welt uh, School in that day. But uh, they had a meeting, so I was mowing the lawn, and one of the elders of the congregation where I preached came by and wanted to know if I was going to the meeting. I said, meeting? I never heard of one. He said, well, the Christian church is meeting with a lot of the elders and ministers of Church Christ. And they're having a banquet. He said, how did you know about it? I said, well, how did you know about it? He said, well, we were invited. So uh, I think everyone really intended for me not to come. Mm -hmm. I don't think they want to end it one day. And so he said, get dressed, Joe, and said, let's go. So I went down with him good banquet. We had a Texas preacher by the name of Jerry Riley. I think it would come out that way. And so uh, he had the idea, the kerygma and the didache, old catcher-sideism. This thing in Missouri is nothing but a revival of catcher-sideism. In other words, the kerygma, the didache. So a number of Christian church preachers were present, and the kerygma and the didache idea had been presented. So they let a number of them speak, and they said, now we need to unite. There's so many immoral things, and we need to unite to fight immorality. Amen from everybody, including most of our brethren. So after the speeches, they opened it up for questions. So I was the first one to ask a question. So a uh, speaker had said that instrumental music was like circumcision. So we shouldn't fight over it because uh, it doesn't make any difference. It's like circumcision. So naturally my first question was, I have a passage of scripture that says circumcision is nothing. Now where is your passage that says instrumental music is nothing? Well at that, uh, I had the whole floor. They no longer addressed their chairman. They aimed all questions at me. So Melvin Weldon, the uh, man in charge, the chairman, kept trying to say, well, Gilmore's not even on the program. He says, address the chair. <laughs> so uh, all questions were addressed to me. And so the idea came up that there are no forms in Christianity. So I brought up the thought of the form of doctrine. Then transform and conform and uh, <laughs> all of these various forms. So finally somebody got up and made a motion that we adjourn. They kicked me out. I've never been invited since. <laughs> so a knucklehead can break up one of these things. Sure yeah. can. By the way, about this concept of his, never been invited again, one of our brethren who attended that said when he got back home to Tennessee, and I've listened to the tape where he said this, that he had been invited to address the Ozark Bible College and their lectureship this next month, or in February, I think he's to give three speeches. His attitude is, I'm thrilled to go. I'd like to go and talk to those people, too. One lesson on respect for Bible authority and not top, stop short of making application to some of these matters. Number two, why the instrument is sinful. And then number three, the real grounds of unity between the two groups. I'm reminded of something that happened to a great preacher of the past over in Tennessee. Brother R.V. Coffin studied under Brother David Lipscomb around the turn of the century. After Brother Coffin began to preach around 1900, he was invited by one of the Christian churches in Nashville to come and speak for them. He was young, inexperienced, had great respect for Brother Lipscomb, didn't know exactly what he ought to do. So he went to his old teacher 
And he said, Brother Lipscomb, I've been invited to come and preach to the Christian church. What would you advise that I do? Brother Lipscomb said, Brother Cawthon, go and preach the gospel. You won't be invited back. He did. He wasn't. Who? Okay. <clears throat> Fred McClung. Okay. I'm concerned about uh, Churches of Christ. You know, uh, there's so many of the members and so many congregations that don't know enough about the various subjects taught in the Bible to know the difference in truth and error when it's taught. And there's too many of our preachers today that won't preach anymore on fundamental issues and differences, things that uh, distinguish uh, truth from error. How long has it been since you've heard a sermon on instrumental music? How long uh, since you've heard a sermon on what the Bible teaches on marriage uh, and the plan of salvation? Uh, too much of our preaching today is a whole lot like Billy Graham. And uh, I think in so many congregations, the preachers don't stand for as much as denominational preachers do. Uh, we are too willing to compromise. There's too much compromising take place, taking place now. So many of our congregations are not much more now than sectarian churches, and something needs to be done about it. Right. And much of the responsibility falls on the shoulders of elders and preachers. I preached in a meeting in Tennessee back in August of last year, July or August, and we had attending that meeting a man from the Northwest. He had come back to visit friends and relatives. He attended every service of the meeting, but on Sunday morning, as I gave the entire plan of salvation in order to become a Christian, as I've done in every sermon as long as I can remember, his comment as he went out the door, he said, it's been three or four years since I've heard the gospel plan of salvation given where I attend. Now, that says something about the preacher, but I think it says even more about an eldership that would allow that to occur. Another lady who formerly worshipped where I preach at the Ripley, Tennessee Church of Christ, she moved away from us to another part of Tennessee, and soon after she got there, they had a meeting. If I were to call the name of the preacher who did the preaching in the meeting, most of you would know him. But she said he used practically no scripture during the meeting, never did give the plan of salvation. At one point, the song leader suggested before they led the invitation song one night, I think it'd be a good idea for us to give the plan of salvation, and he gave it to the congregation. That's a sad commentary when that occurs among us. And elders who allow such to go on are going to answer for it, and preachers who fall for that kind of soft approach are going to answer for it also. Brother Eddie. Brother Taylor. Okay, uh, then. They permitted me one more little statement. What Brother Joe Gilmore said about uh, the Catcher City and connection with uh, Don DeWelt and some of the others perhaps needs a little more massaging. I think it was significant that in the summit, number one, the first paper, one body that came out, which is a merging effort paper, if I understand it correctly, published by Don DeWeld, edited by Victor Knowles, had a featured article by W. Carl Ketcherside in it. Number two, although Brother Bowles' tract was picked up and was ridiculed, publicly by Brother Cloyd at the summit meeting, packets of material were put together by uh, Don DeWelt's publishing company, made available for those who attended the summit, and there were four items in the packet, three of which were written by W. Carl Ketcherside. That says something about their intentions on fellowship. It says a great deal. I would just as soon uh, change the nomenclature of that effort to the, to the basement rather than the summit. We, uh, we would not uh, be
be remiss, I don't believe, in expressing our heartfelt thanks to Brother Taylor for conducting this forum. It's been one of the, one of the good things about these kind of sessions is that it allows us to consider some of the things that are going on in our brotherhood and to discuss it openly and hopefully prayerfully and biblically so that we can not only be warned against uh, issues that threaten us, but that we can be encouraged concerning issues that will support the word of God and our worship to him. We are so grateful for everybody's presence. We want you to come back tonight. Now, we're going to have our hair curled tonight. The speakers tonight are Wayne Jackson and Bert Thompson. Wayne will be speaking at 7 o'clock on moral aspects of modern medical and scientific technology. And if you don't know what he has to say, you don't know what the issues are that, to which he will be addressing, uh, then you need to be here because these are upon us now. It's not some threat that is uh, out there in the distance. It's here now. It's something that we are going to be confronted with or are confronted with, with which our children are confronted with or, and going to be confronted with. This type of thing has the capability of altering the entire course of what we consider to be ethical. And then Bert Thompson, the effect of situation ethics on moral values. And if this is, uh, I, I wish we could get Wayne and Bert both up here at the same time, speaking at the same time, and uh, just kind of weaving these topics together because they are of such vital uh, importance in the lives of every one of us and all of our progeny that uh, we need very desperately to understand what these things are and be equipped to combat them. Right now we're going to be dismissed. We want you to be sure that you, if you have questions for tomorrow's open forum, Brother Hardiman Nichols will be here to moderate the forum for us. Uh, give them to Brother Taylor or to me, and we'll, uh, we'll pass them on to uh, Hardiman, and he will do a good job on that tomorrow. We want you to, if you do not have your leadership dinner tickets, this is the very last time I'm going to say anything about them. Uh, I suspect that you'll be able to uh, get one even in line, and so you just be sure that you attend the uh, leadership dinner coming up at 5 o'clock. The need for moral excellence, excellence in leadership, Brother Furman Curley will be speaking on that subject at that time. Buy your lectureship book. Take advantage of the displays. And enjoy our picture out there on top of the Brown Trail School of Preaching uh, display. You'll like it. Okay. Sir? Oh, no laughing aloud is uh, what. All right, we'll be dismissed now, and uh, our leadership dinner at 5 o'clock. Thank you.